take the light over earlier. I'm afraid that thing's going to catch on fire there, so I got AJ to fix that. Me and my big old clumsy feet sometimes, you know how that goes. But we're so thankful you're here today. We're thankful to, for the Prines to be back. I'm telling you, boy, we miss you, brother, when you're not here. And I know you needed that break and had a great time. I bet your mom-in-law was glad that you got home too, wasn't you? <laughs> uh, that's some good kids, though. I don't think she had any problems with their behavior. But thank God that you're back safe. And thank God you're all here. And Ralph came to his surgery well this week. Thank God for that. And others that have had some issues... Uh, we thank God for answering prayer, and I'll continue to pray for the those that are sick, and that we, as we call you, we'll usually put it on the Countryside Family Facebook page. Who has a uh, directory you can bring up here real quick for me? Who has one? Run it up here to me just for a second, if you don't mind. Who has one? I didn't get mine back there. Got one, Carl. Let me have that just for a second. I got to brag a little bit on the right person, but aren't you thankful for this? Isn't that cool? You know, where's Miss Carol? She don't like to be recognized, but in the very back row, Carol. She's right here. She's right here? Where's she at, Alan? Right here by me. <laughs> thank you, Miss Carol, for putting this together for us. Isn't that beautiful? And uh, thank you, Greg. Where's Greg at? He's up in the sound booth. Is he there? But uh, taking the pictures for us. And uh, if you didn't get your picture in, it's because you didn't come when we told you to come get your picture taken. And, and we held off and held off and held off, held off trying to get everybody in there. But th isn't that nice? Thank you. Thank you, Miss Carol, for all the hard work and dedication. And is it, who is this, Miss uh, Arlene's? We want to steal hers, her book. So thank you all. Thank you all very much. This message is, is not an easy message to preach. It's kind of a hard message for any pastor to, to talk about, but I guarantee you this, all across our land, I'm sure that similar clarion calls are being war, war, calls of warning are being trumpeted across the land for those that know the book and know where we are in the history of our country and the history of our world. I really believe in the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he's, He is on the way. <laughs> we don't know what day, we don't know what hour, but I'll tell you this, if, you're, if your life is not right, you better get it right now, okay? Word of God talks about that many places. In one place it talked about the virgins and waiting for the bridegroom to come and some were foolish, some were wise and, and they said make sure you have oil in your lamps because you don't know what hour the, 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 the Holy Spirit or when, when God will send Jesus to the earth. And, but I really believe and we, we believe that it's an imminent return of Jesus. And I really believe that we, we may be entering America's final days. I mean... America, uh, if God doesn't judge America, I think he's going to have to dig up Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize to them. That's how wicked our nation has been, a nation that has been so blessed of God, a nation founded upon godly principles, and yet look how far we've fallen, look how far we've gone away from the, the Word of God and what our nation was founded upon. And listen, it's not funny, it's not cute, it's not nice. Listen, our nation has, has gone away from God. And turned on God. We kicked God out of the schools in 1963. It's 2024. Now look at, look at what is happening in our nation as a result. It's taken all these years to push and push and push, push Christianity and push God into the background, push God out of the public institutions. And now what do we have on our streets? Now what are, what are we having force-fed to our children in government school? Listen, we're not in a good way. And I really believe we may be entering America's final days. And I believe the, the judgment of God is on the way. It's coming. But I, I pray you that the coming of Christ is here. And He takes Christians out of there before He lowers the moon on this country. But listen, do you know how many babies have been murdered by just in America alone since 1973? Roe versus Wade. Thank God we, we overturned that and slowed it down. But that hasn't stopped the slaughter of the innocent in all these years. And I promise you this, the blood of those innocent babies cry out to the God of heaven for vengeance and cry out to the God of, of, of mercy and for judgment upon those that took their lives and, and, and those in power that, that approved and accommodated that. And not only that, but when a nation mocks God and laughs at God, thumbs their nose up to God as, what, as far as what he says about marriage and about sexuality and those sorts of things. There's, there's a payday coming. Galatians, there's one place that says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And that's going to be true for not only an individual, 
It's going to be true for a nation that has walked away from God. And, and as I said, individuals. It's, it's applicable to individuals too. When, it, when an individual walks away from God and he does it, he, he knows right and he has heard right and he's practiced living right before and then they're not anymore. Listen, judgment's coming. It's not if, it's when, it's coming. But it's coming on America. I hope not soon. I hope he, he would stay it for us and hold it off a little while. But I really believe that he's coming to judge our nation. I believe we're on, in our final days. Our nation has been in a moral tailspin now for many, many years. I remember as a, as a child, and I was in school during that time when they quit, kicked God out of school. And I remember slowly but surely they began to remove anything to do with Christianity. And anything to do with the Bible, it was only that was the beginning point. Now in our time, now they remove anything that's anything that's wasp, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, Christian, has been pulled out of the system, and it's been replaced with whatever. Listen, we're in, we're in dire straits today, and America has been a moral tailspin all these years. The rule of law that kept us safe since our beginning has been eroded and disrespected by many of the judges that are in our land ruling now. Uh, our police are being ambushed and killed in their cars. What? Where'd that come from? Well, it comes from the spirit of, of anarchy and in in this mystery of iniquity that the Bible talks about that is going to come in the latter days. We have... We've had a president in the past, and a couple of presidents back, he pardoned 54 or 64 hardened criminals and turned them back loose into society. That's only one president. And many of these were drug dealers and that sort of thing, and he pardoned them, put them back in our streets. And nowadays, in a lot of the uh, cities, and the big cities that are having all the crime, they won't even convict people on drugs and even violence. They turn them loose. What's wrong with that picture? Well, what's wrong with that picture is that's not how America was set up. America was set up as a system of, of justice, you know, and, and we had people in power that would punish wrongdoers and thank God for that. But uh, we have abandoned that, haven't we? Gone away from that. The Supreme Court aban abandoned God's rules and laws and passed new legislation that's ridiculous. Overturned 5,000 Proven years of what marriage is all about. And, and just by an edict of their nine unelected judges voted marriage down. What's wrong with that picture? Well, it's just a picture of the moral tailspin that America's been in. As I said before, this is, is hard to preach this because it's, I don't want to, you to leave here terrified, but I want you to leave here shocked. And I want you to leave here with determination in your life to not only make sure you are right personally, but also your home is right if you're the leader of your home, but also begin influencing your neighbors and your friends and try to tell people in our fear of influence about Christ so that they will go to heaven one day when the Lord judges this earth. And, he, and America might not even... You know that America is not even mentioned in prophecy? The greatest... Power, most powerful nation on earth, you don't find it in prophecy, do you? Wonder why. Wonder where they went. Wonder what happens. I don't know yet. I don't know the answer to that. I pray that we're not the nation in Revelation where it says that one nation that all the earth traded with is destroyed in one hour. And you see this, and all the ships are watching it burn. And they're saying, what happened to the great country, you know? And, they, and you see the smoke going up from the destruction of that country. And the people that traded and made money on that nation are mourning. And I pray that's not us. But I'm not saying it's not us. But I don't think you find anything about this nation, America, in prophecy. Now, go to Daniel chapter 5. And I'm going to read a few verses in, in, of this chapter. And uh, probably, let me see, it's, I'm going to read 31 verses. So don't get... Read the whole chapter. I don't want you to get bored, but I want you to understand, I really believe there's a parallel of what happened to this nation that we're going to read about and what's going to happen to America if we don't change our ways rapidly and, and what's going to happen to that nation and what happened in one night 
in which the greatest nation on the earth of that time was destroyed in one night could happen to America. But apply it personally. What happened to them and when they were destroyed in one night can happen to an individual that doesn't listen to God. An individual that mocks God like these people did. And the judgment came and fell in one night and destroyed that great nation. Could destroy our great nation. But if you're a human being, individual, that's not listening to God, could destroy you in one night. Here's a question for you. How long does it take a nation to go from a godly point of life and point of view to paganism? How many generations? One or two generations maximum, okay? When you read this story, I want you to think about something. This guy was Nebuchadnezzar's like grandson, okay? Remember Nebuchadnezzar? What did God say in that image of Daniel about and Daniel interpreted, he, and there was an image of gold, remember, a head of gold, remember? He said, who was the head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, you're the greatest, greatest king, according to God's prophecy to him, of that whole part of the world was him. Now, here we are, a couple of generations from him, down, down his downline, if you will, and see where they are. And what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, by the way? Remember, it was a pagan nation, but you had a lot of the prophets were living there. What? You say Jewish prophets living in Babylon? and what? How did they end up there? How did God's people end up down there in Babylon? And why were they there? Who can tell me? <laughs> they were taken, where were they taken away from? Why? Same story. Okay, so they were hauled off into God's people, God's chosen people, hauled into captivity by the Assyrian, later Babylonian government to be punished for how long? Long time, huh? I think it was 70, wasn't it? Well, 470. Anyway, research that number. Why were they down there? Being punished, right? But while they were there, a lot of them prospered. A lot of them did good. The prophets, a lot of your prophet, prophets in the Bible were written from there. You know, Jeremiah and Isaiah and all those guys, some of those guys lived there, okay? And Dan, just think of, of old Daniel. Hmm. What did Daniel do in that pagan government? Remember what he did? What did he do? He did what? Right. So he was a, he was a prophet. Soothsayer, they call him. He said, "Get all the soothsayers and the magicians and let them interpret my dreams." Guess who the only one who could do it? God's man. Okay. So he rose up to power. Do you, have you ever thought about this? Think about how many echelons of power Daniel lived through. <laughs> he, hey. The worst people in the world were ruling the world, and yet God's man was in place. God's man was advisor to the king of a pagan nation. You say, what? See, God has a real sense of humor. I don't care how bad our president is, and how, of course, there's a lot of bad stuff. God has some people in that power structure somewhere that belong to him. Yeah. God never leaves himself without a witness. So somebody in that power structure somewhere or like the Daniels and the Shadrachs and the Meshach and Abednego's of our time. They're back there and they're actually giving wisdom and power sometimes to the, the very people that we don't like and that, that rule us in such a terrible way. Same thing happening back then. And here, a couple generations down the line, we're, we're going to go down the line a little bit. We're going to get to Daniel chapter 5. So as you think about it, think about how long does it take a nation to go from godliness to paganism? Do you think Babylon, the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar ever got right with God? Think about it for a minute. Did they ever get right with God? Yeah. When? <laughs> yeah. God gave him that disease and he thought he was a cow and had to 
feed him straw and his hair grew along with me. And he said, when you get your mind right and you get your heart right, then I'll restore your kingdom. So when he got right, remember the, when, when the, remember the fiery furnace and all that? He said, that God is the one we're going to worship, remember? So all of Babylonians had to, by force, <laughs> by the government, they had to believe in the God of the Bible and Daniel's God for a while. So it, that prospered that nation. But echelons change, people change, next generation comes along, and generation is ri- ri- rises up that doesn't know the God of their parents and their grandparents. That's what, you're, that's what we're talking to. And see, what had happened was they had hauled all the Jews into captivity. Remember? Captured Jerusalem. They took all the stuff from the temple, cataloged it perfectly, which is weird. You read that in the Bible. It just blows my mind. Later on, when they send the stuff back, they had every single thing they took from Jerusalem out of God's tabernacle and temple there, the, the temple in Jerusalem. They sent everything back exactly like they had taken it years and years. Isn't that crazy how God does that? So here they are. They're over there in Babylon. And they have some of the very holy utensils that are only to be used in the temple and the, the Holy of Holies and that kind of thing. And they get them out and they're having a drunken orgy party. Kind of like the people do today. Just drinking it and having, having a ball, you know. And they're using the holy instruments that were never supposed to be touched by anybody but the high priest, never supposed to be used anywhere but in, in the worship in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, in that, that, you know, those kind of utensils. So in your mind, you got a, a, a nation, that, this guy, the king of, we're going to read about, his granddaddy had led the nation to follow the, the God of Daniel, and now... It's deteriorated to this point. In a couple of generations, they're back like they were before God used Daniel and the others to help turn them around. So, only how many generations? Fathers and mothers. You better be careful. You better pour the, the faith into your children. It only takes one generation and two to really turn away from God in, a, in, a, in, a, in people and in nations. Our, our country founded upon godly principles, and now we're in the, what year is this? 2023 divided, or take, take away 1776. How many years is that? Somebody can do it real quick in your brain for me. How many years? 270? 247 years, plus or minus, to where we are today. Hmm. How many generations is that? 200 divided by, what, 60 years in a generation? What's that? 5 times 6 is 300, right? Yeah, so about 4 generations, 5 generations, 6 generations. We Look where we are. Christian nation to what we are today, and I, and I have hesitate to call us a, even though we we're founded on, I hesitate to call us a Christian nation today. That's where we're going to pick up the reading of what happened in Babylon. Belshazzar the king, verse one, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords, and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was, was in Jerusalem, that the king and the princes and his wives and concubines might drink therein. What? They brought the holy items from the temple? And, and, and he's got his princes, wives, Bronchi binds. Mm, think about that. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of God, which was at, at, at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, wives, and concubines drank in them. They drank wine and, and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and wood of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Whoa, just suppose that suddenly you just saw a hand and it starts, not up here, but on the wall, it's writing so you can read it. That'd be kind of freaky, wouldn't it? That's what was happening. said, 
The king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loose and his knees began to smoke one together. He got so afraid he's just shaking. The king cried aloud and bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, and they could not read the writing, nor make known the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom. <laughs> Think about this for a minute. Guys, have you ever had your wife tell you something? You, you thought you had it figured out and you didn't, and then your wife came up with the answer? None of y'all never faced that, right? I hear you chuckling. All of us have been there. You know, our wives have some real good wisdom, don't they? Sometimes we don't think they do. We think, oh, they're just women. They don't know anything. No, they have, they have wonderful wisdom. They're our helpmeet. They are the ones that God sent alongside of us to help us, and help us get stuff right. Amen? And here, one of his queens. <laughs> There's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the day of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him. Whom the, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, my father, make haste, or made haste to the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much there is an excellent spirit and knowledge and understandings, interpretation of dreams, showing of hard sentences, dissolving of doubts, were found in the same who? Daniel. There's old Daniel. Boy, he's, he's, he's still there. He'd like to energize their bunny rabbit. All that stuff's happening and the echelons are changing. Daniel's still going. going on, he's still going for the Lord. This found in the same Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king and the king spake unto Daniel, Art thou Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom thy, the, father, the king my father sought or brought out of Jerusalem? Out of, of Jewry, Jewry, I have heard of thee, and that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known unto the interpretation of thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I've heard of thee, that thou could make, a, make interpretations. Dissolve doubts. Now, if thou can read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about thy neck, now shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O thou, king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, a kingdom and majesty and glory, glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, language trembled and feared before him, whom he would, whom he would slew and whom he would be kept alive and whom he would set up and whom he would put down. But when his heart was lifted up and mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart made like the beast. And his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with dew of heaven. Till he knew, till he knew what? Read it to me. That he knew what? That the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed it over whomsoever he will. Hmm. You think you're in control. Okay? You think you're in control of your life. You're not. Yeah, you're making your own decisions right now, but remember this. There's a God in heaven that rules in the affairs of men, rules in the affairs of nations, rules in the affairs of individuals. And he said to Belshazzar, O thou his son, Belshazzar, 
Hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this? But hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven? <laughs> You're going to shake your fist in God's face, Belshazzar? He said, They have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and now thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them? And thou hast praised the gods of the silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, in whose all thy ways thou hast not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tico, upsaran. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, meaning God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tico, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then the, the, they commanded Belshazzar and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be third ruler in the kingdom. And that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. And Darius the Mede took the kingdom being about three score and two years old. Hmm. One night, in one night, he lost his whole kingdom. Now, Interesting, he said, what did he say? He said, I'll make you what? Give you a chain of gold and I'll make you what kind of, what, what, what did he say do to him? Third ruler, interesting, huh? Huh, weird, huh? This great empire that we're talking about. In fact, I was trying to find a map to tell you how big it was. Babylon was, was the, one of the wonders of the ancient world. The hanging gardens of Babylon are still talked about to this day and it was an ecologist dream of, of all kinds of plants and uh, fauna and wildlife and in a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city. The stones were covered with blue ceramic with, with these pictures with, painted in gold on them. And they found remnants of that, not perfect pieces, but remnants of these things. In fact, when Saddam Hussein was trying to, to uh, keep his power and make it bigger, he was re trying to rebuild Babylon. <laughs> And he, was, he designed bricks that were baked with blue uh, ceramic on it, and they put his picture on there. Saddam Hussein, the king of kings. And they, of course, what happened to Saddam Hussein? You know, what happened to Iraq? You know, and, and our soldiers really trampled underfoot all of those plans when we went over there. But Babylon was a huge, huge, huge empire. If you put the, it would probably be about the size of the United States. If he put the United States right there, that whole part of of Middle East and, and uh, right in going over into the Mediterranean, about about the size of America, maybe a little bigger, big 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 empire that he ruled. And and what did it say there? It said your daddy could kill anybody he wanted, pretty much. What he said went. He was the king of kings and lord of lords of that day. But see, they had a fatal mistake. A generation later or two, when his son or grandson Belshazzar comes along, he. Uh, Forgot about what his daddy and granddaddy had taught him. Forgot about the God of God, the God of heaven, and who really controls in the affairs of men. See, it's easy as you go through life, you can kind of forget God sometimes. You can kind of forget what God has done in the past. You can kind of forget where you were with God, and you can start living like you want to live. And let, let me just tell you this. There's a payday someday. It's coming, okay? It's coming for a person. It's coming for a nation. And, and I think we are seeing the latter end of our days. We could be in our final days. But here, uh, Belshazzar, you know, they, he just made a fatal mistake. What do you think one of his mistakes was? What do you think he, what do you think he went did wrong? Huh? Well, they were doing, what did you say? Use the vessels. But what really, when he was doing that, what was he really doing? He was mocking God. How many of you like to be mocked? How many of you have children? Raise your hand if you've got kids. How many of you mamas let the young and mock you? If you're mom, you say, Johnny, go clean up your room. They go, me, 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 make me. What are you going to do? <laughs> I wouldn't do that to my mama. No. I made one, fate, one mistake one time. I kicked my mama one time. Really. 
Never did that again. <laughs> My jaw right there, still somewhat dislocated. <laughs> In those days, they could whip you like they should, but we, we were... We had hounds in those days, and we came home from church one day, and I was probably about 10 or 12, and feeling my oats, thinking I knew everything, and, and the hounds had gotten in my mama's azaleas, and one of, one of my favorite hounds had dug him a hole out, and he was just cooling in the shade. My mama, she was so mad, she, saw, she picked up one of them little toy metal trackers, and back in those days, she could hurl. I mean, she could throw. You know what hurl means? Okay, she could throw. And not only throw, she could run. She could outrun six kids. She could outrun all of us in those days. Now, poor thing back there, she's having to use a walker a little bit these days, but you couldn't outrun her in those days. She picked up that tracker and hurled it, and she hit that dog upside the head, and he went, oh, 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 oh. And little old snotty nose, know-it-all kid, I went, boom, right there. Don't kick your mama. Don't ever kick your mama. In a flash, in a split millisecond, I felt myself flying through the air. <laughs> Boom, landed on my back. And I think she did one of them spinning back fists or something. Boom, one of those like a karate move or something. I still hadn't figured out what it was, but came so fast. And, 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 and before I could get my breath, she was upon me, sitting on me. Boy, don't you ever do that to me again. Boom. Then she got her, her switch. Not only knocked me down, she got her switch and tore my little tail. I needed it. I deserved it. But I learned one thing. Don't never kick your mama. <laughs> but see, their fatal mistake, they were mocking God. If, if our earthly parents don't want to be mocked and people that we're older, uh, under, we work under don't want to be mocked, you think God wants to be mocked? No. God is not mocked, the scripture says. You think you can mock God. You think you can do what you want to do. Thumb your nose up at God. You better, you better hold on because it's coming. Okay? It ain't if, it's when. It's coming. And it's, it's going to be a lot worse than a spinning back fist. And, and mama sitting on your chest working on you. It's going to be bad. You know? And they made that fatal mistake that day holding a drunken orgy, using the holy things that God had set aside just for his temple. And uh, really, it's like our government today. We have, a, have rulers in power that are asleep at the wheel. They have no clue how to run America. Our president we have now has no clue. I don't know if he's awake. They have to wake him up. Here, sign this, you know. We have a, we have a government that's asleep at the wheel, okay? They've been asleep at the wheel a long time. They care about making deals with buddies up there so that they get kickbacks and that, that sort of thing. Listen, they were asleep at the wheel. They were mocking God. Uh, <laughs> fatal mistakes, weren't they? Uh, and then this mysterious handwriting pops up on the wall. Hmm. In that writing, God was declaring their judgment, wasn't He? He didn't have to say a word. He just wrote it with His finger and had His, his prophet interpret it for Him, for, to them. His hand appears and this mysterious message. It's, it terrifies the cra the king's so shook up. His knees are knocking together. I, I would think if I was him, I'd be scared too. See, some people don't have any fear of God. Listen, does God need to do something in your life to make you fear Him? I promise you this: if you're stupid enough to wait on God to make you fear Him, you're dumb. You're not dumb. You're just something wrong with you. You know, because you don't think God can get your attention. He's going to get your attention. He got the greatest king, the biggest king, the most powerful king's attention. Turned him into a vegetable pretty much and had to live like a cow for a while until he got his attention. God can get your attention. Here, uh, God is pronouncing judgment on this crowd. It terrifies the king. And, and it said his nation had been found wanting. He'd waited didn't measure up. God says, oh, I'm done with your nation. You don't want to serve me? You don't want, you don't want to teach your people to serve me? You don't want to raise your kids to serve me? You don't want to honor the, the God of heaven? I got a new king right outside the gate that I'm going to bring in. Yeah, 
He had somebody outside the gate while this was happening. See, you saw that picture of how big that, that, that Babylon was, humongous wall, I mean, impregnable walls. You could not defeat Babylon hardly. And it had the, the, the Euphrates River ran around and through the city of Babylon. Like a, I mean, like a flowing moat. I don't know what they had in the river. They might have had crocodile. I don't know what they had in there, but you couldn't beat Babylon. Or could you? <laughs> or could you? Hmm. The queen said, uh, I know a man. <laughs> During your daddy's time, he interpreted dreams, and he's still around. Well, who is he? She says, Daniel. Bring him, bring him quick. He said, Daniel, can you, can you tell what this is? He said, God will help me tell you what it is. And he did. He interpreted the dream. Meeny, meeny, tickle. Oops, sorry. Hmm. You're, you've been found. You didn't measure up. How about this? Are you measuring up? Are you living up to what you're supposed to be and how you ought to be? What if God would away you right now? Would He say you're you meet the will you meet the bill? Or he would he say you don't measure up? What does the Bible say about sinners? Does any does any sinner measure up on his own? No. All have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We come out of the womb <laughs> uttering blasphemies, it said. You know, you don't have to teach little youngins to lie and say bad stuff. No. It comes out of their heart. It comes out of when they are around other people and they just it, they pick that up before they'll pick good stuff up. I remember growing up in a southeast side on Gainesville, a pretty rough neighborhood. And we came out of Otter Creek, which is a country area, only like a two-room schoolhouse, moved to inner city Gainesville. Had to go to Kirby Smith downtown. Had to, uh, 12 blocks from our inner city home there in Porter's Quarters over to where the school was. Once Mama taught us the route, I was only old, old enough to one to be able to walk there, so I would walk to school, walk home. And I got in with some, some companions that taught me all kind of stuff I'd never heard before. I mean, words, I'd never, I didn't know what they were. But being a kid and curious, I learned some stuff that you shouldn't say. None of y'all probably ever learned stuff like that, right? But see, we're a product of our environment in that sense. And we, we're sinners by heart anyway, and then we can easily pick up other sins by being around. But one, one scripture says, bad company corrupts good morals. You've heard that scripture before. True. And see, we all don't really measure up. Jesus did, thank God. But here, this bunch is having their orgy and their party and they're <laughs> woo, scared the king. He's trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, nobody could interpret it except Daniel, God's man. You know, that's interesting. With all that's going on, do you know who really knows what's going on today? God does, but who else knows? God's people. People that know the book know what's happening. You know why it's happening. You know what's coming. Listen, if you walk with God and you know the book, that's like having a newspaper, a modern day newspaper in your hand of what's coming. You know what's coming. We know the beginning from the end. We know what, what, what God judges and what God doesn't judge. We know how to keep people out of God's judgment. We know how to keep people out of hell. We know how to, pe how to help people have a better future. Listen, you, sister and brother, Christian, you have such power in your hands through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the keys to the kingdom. Jesus gave us the keys. Whatever we unloose on earth is unloosed in heaven. What we bind on earth can be bound in heaven just by doing what God told us to do, being like Daniel, the Daniel of our times. And here he comes in and he interprets that handwriting and he tells them what it means, you know. God's numbered the kingdom and it's finished. You know, thou art weighed in the balances and are found warning. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. 
Hmm, interesting. Oh, back up a minute. He said, I'll make you what, what ruler in the kingdom? Why didn't he make him second ruler? Or why couldn't he have made him second ruler? Anybody know? Some of you know, but if you, if you know the answer, raise your hand for a minute. Why, why third ruler? Well, you get, go ahead, stab at it. Close. Nabonidus was actually under after, I think it was Nabonidus was after Nebuchadnezzar. He liked to hunt. How many hunters we got here? <laughs> We're all hunters. We like to go, in fact, go in our bathroom. It's, it's very politically incorrect. We got dead animals stuffed on the wall in there, so you take a tour of our bathroom. But the, the king liked to hunt and fish and stuff and do safari. So he's gone. He turns it over to Belshazzar to rule while he's gone. So Belshazzar was number two. So he couldn't say, I'll make you number two. He was number two. He says, I'll make you number three, ruler in the kingdom. Now, isn't that weird how suddenly this old man who had been living there in all Babylon all these years, working for the different echelons coming through there, and now he's the what ruler in the kingdom of Babylon? <laughs> Go figure. God's man is third ruler in the kingdom. Belshazzar's dead now, so who's the first ruler? Th that is gone somewhere hunting. So Daniel moves up. Daniel is the ruler in absentee of the real king. Okay. So who's it say came? Who took over after this? You remember? Did you read? Have you know? Do you know your history? Well. Sudden judgment comes. Do you know how they? You know how they got in the city. Anybody know that? You might know this. Let me tell you. The river flowed in and through the city of Babylon. So Darius the Mede and the Persians dammed the river up, lowered the water level. While these people are drunk and partying, the enemy is lowering the water level. They march under the walls at night conquer the city almost without a shot. In one night, the strongest kingdom on the earth defeated in one night. Now, I hear people all the time, oh, America, we're so strong. We're stronger than anybody in the world. God can change that in one night, one day. Here, sudden judgment happens on them. And, and, uh, and Listen, guys and girls, this strong city, this most beautiful city in the world, Gone in one night, conquered in one night. Remember God's word, Proverbs 29 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Proverbs 9 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. Another scripture in Proverbs says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When I was at college years ago with Dr. Falwell, well, I heard that I heard that sermon on Proverbs nineteen twenty four. You know, righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach. He preached that hard and and drummed it into us, and I believe it's still true today. That listen, when when a nation tries to do right and tries to honor the God of the Bible and tries to make sure their culture is walking with God, there's a blessing of God on it. But when a nation starts adopting the sins of the world and and trumpeting them in parades across their land. The very things that God abhors and the very things that God judges and they want to have parades and celebrate and have pride events for stuff like that? Listen, judgment's coming, okay? The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. This nation, the Babylonians, forgot God and suddenly there's a new ruler in place. Darius and Medes and the Persians come in and and they're, they're, when they absorb with Babylon, they got their, all of their stuff together. It's huge. They rule the whole world at that time. And old Darius the Mede was a, was a very, or Cyrus the Great, excuse me, was an interesting guy. Darius and Cyrus ruled 
Now, you know, the Medes and the Persians ruled together. Here's what Cyrus the Great said. He said, whenever you can act as a liberator, freedom, dignity, wealth, these three things constitute the greatest happiness of humanity. If you bequeath all three to your people, their love for you will never die. Well, who does that sound like? Sounds like a certain party of our people of America today. You give them free stuff, make them happy. They'll, they'll vote for you forever, won't they? So same, same kind of rulers back then that we have today. You see, we've had some really foolish kings in our nation. Change we can believe in. Remember that mantra that was trumpeted a few years back on one of the presidential candidates? Really what the, the hope and change movement was to change America from what we are to a communist nation. Communist slash Islamic nation. And that all started the downhill slide of what happened not only morally, but look what's happened to our culture. Look at was what happened to our history. Did you realize, and, and young people don't even, can't even see this or understand this, you older people can, you, you married couples can. They're rewriting your history and our history right now. Do you know why they're taking down the monuments? It's not because of racism. It's because they're rewriting everything. And they're, all that history is gone in secular history. Listen, it's, not, it's re -re revisionist history. And, and the change that we can believe in is not changing it to something away from what it was. I liked it like it was. And I think a, a constitutional republic is the best thing we can live under. You know, we, we're not a democracy. People think we're democracy. No, don't, don't make the mistake of thinking we're democracy. No. Democracy is mob rule. That's not what you want. We want a republic where the rights of the individual are preserved with a written constitution. It doesn't matter what the majority says. If they violate your written rule in the constitution, they can't overrule you, and they can't rule you with their particular rule. Now, they want to have a democracy, and they want to have mod rule. I don't want to live in democracy because democracy is a short step to a dictator of some sort that will be horrible for us. We don't want that. We want constitutional republic. So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the, uh, to the democracy. No, to the republic, right? That's what we are. We're a republic. But our sinful nation, they, oh, they've had some different views. And we march in pride, in pride, thumbing our nose up at the God of heaven. And time said, if you go back and look at that, that during that one president was our first, called our first gay president. He didn't claim that, but that's what Time Magazine had it on the front page. Must be some kind of proof to it or they wouldn't have put it on there. Remember this, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When you start thumbing your nose up in the, the face of God of heaven, it's not if, it's when, okay? Expect something to come. Expect some change. Expect the God of heaven to step in. Isn't it interesting that Satan attacks that, what I'm telling you today? Huh. When that happens, I'm thinking, right on glide scope, right on course. And, and it's what you need to hear. Righteousness is all the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Listen. America's not special in the sense that we, we're gonna, God's going to spare us because we, oh yeah, we were a, a Christian nation at one time. God, well, God's going to be, he's going to let us off the hook. No, he's not. Not unless we repent, not unless we turn. Listen, and as a human being, as, a, as an individual, listen, don't you, don't you mock God. You're, you're in dangerous ground if you do. See, we've reached America's last hour decision. This really is our last time in our period of history to make a change, okay? I really believe there's hope or I wouldn't be preaching this to you. 
but this is our last opportunity. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the next election. I don't even know who's going to run, but I know this. I pray God will give us a leader that can help turn America around. And, uh, and I'm really praying for that. Uh, remember this. Satan is ne always, he never gives up ground without a fight. And uh, there's trouble on our horizon. And, and believers like you and I are going to have to stand up and, and be counted. Listen, quit hiding. Don't hide your Christianity. Everybody else is coming out of the closet. You better come out too. And you better, you better be making a difference in your family. You better be making a difference in your neighborhood. You better be making a difference in your city. You better be making a difference in your county. You better be making a difference in your state. When we do those things, we take care of the local things first, then we can affect other things in a good way. And it's not that we want to control everybody. It's the fact we want to, we hope our nation will turn back to the God of the Bible and back to what we believed before. Church family, I believe that this next election is going to be pivotal in our, in our history. I really do. So let's pray about who's coming, who's going to run. Pray that God will raise up someone like I, Cyrus the Great wasn't a Christian, but but if you read what he did later, you'll be you'll be pleased by how God used him to do stuff that benefited God's people in the kingdom of God. And I think that God uses secular people many times that, to do His bidding and make changes for His own people. So remember, we're entering or could be entering America's final days. Uh, and you're either part of the problem or you're part of the cure. If you're a believer, you say, you, you say I would say if I were to have a show of hands, how many of you believe in the Lord and love Jesus, you'd raise your hand. Amen. Okay. Don't raise your hand this time. How many of you are living in known habitual sin and you hadn't repented? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't identify yourself. Only the Holy Spirit is identifying you right now. And he's telling you right now, that the handwriting on the wall is on your life right this second, okay? The handwriting has been written, and you're only a night or two away from judgment in your life. God's not going to mess with it, okay? He's not going to, he's not going to, Bible says, Jesus, or God says, my spirit will not always strive with man, meaning he's not going to, you think, well, he's loving and kind and he's forgiving. Listen, there's a limit to that, okay? There's a limit to that. Mamas, and daddies, how much patience do you have with your children? How long do you put up with their nonsense before you you step in? When they're going, nah, 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 boo, boo, you're not going to tell me what to do. How long, how long does it take you mamas to step in? Miss Prime, how long would it take you to? About four seconds. <laughs> she, got, she raises a good kid. Listen, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Listen, handwriting is on the wall. It's, it's on the wall for America. It's on the wall for believers that aren't doing right. Listen, get things right. Now's the time. Now is the accepted time. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the cure. And if you're you're a, a Christian that's living in known habitual sin, you're part of the reason God's bringing judgment on America. The Bible says, let judgment begin at the house of God. See, we're supposed to get ourselves right. If we get right, then we can talk to other people about getting right. But listen, you don't need to be part of the problem. You need to be part of the cure. The good news is that you're still alive and you can repent. What does repent mean? So repent means you found out you're going the wrong way and you say, oh, man, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm going to go your way. That's repentance. It's, a, it's an about face. It's a turn and going back in the direction that you should be going. But, it, but it, listen, the forgiveness of God is tied to that. God's not going to forgive you unless you repent. That's, repentance starts the forgiveness of God. It's that people think, well, I can just do like I want to, and God loves me, and blah, 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 and i got eternal security. You better be very careful thinking like that. Yes, I believe in eternal security. I absolutely believe in that. But I believe that the, the forgiveness of God is there's some conditional things about that. If you won't forgive other people, what does Jesus say? God's not going to forgive you. If you don't repent, God's not going to forgive you. Okay? You have to be willing to turn. So 
And, and I, I was getting preparing for this, and, and this scripture came to mind. And, and it was, remember Jonah ran away from God. He told him, go to the Ninevites and preach. And he, he said, not me, man. Them some bad people. I'm not going down there. Got on the ship, took off. He got in a storm, and where is Jonah? He's in the back of the boat sleeping, and, the, and the, the ship is about to sink. And the ship captain came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Here's these lost people on the ship. They're praying. They don't even know who they're praying to, but they're throwing their stuff overboard, and they're praying to, to, with all their might to their pagan gods, and they wake up. The, the real Christian on board was asleep, sinful and sleeping in the back of the boat. How was he sinful? He wasn't doing what God told him to do. And he's asleep. What? Listen, if you're Jonah today, I'm going to pray God won't let you sleep for the next month. I'm serious. I'm going to pray that. I say, Lord, do not let him sleep. A lot worse than that is this. You know what the Bible says to do if a, if a brother is sinning and he won't get right? You talk to him. Then you go with the witness and talk to him. And if they continually go, boo-boo, we're not going we to listen, not gonna listen to you. You know what God tells the church to do then? Anybody want to know? Turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. Listen. I don't like that as a pastor. It's that's to me is harsh, but I have to do it if, if God tells me to do it. And I don't want to do that. Nobody. It's, it's, it's hurtful. It's painful. And I don't know what, how bad. Well, the one guy they did that to. Remember, First Corinthians five was where they first start talking about it. I think, and and the guy was having relations with his stepmom or mama or something. It said, I can't believe it was his mother, but later on it says he had relations with his mother. I, I had to be a stepmama. I can't even imagine that. But anyway, he was, it was so bad, he, they kicked him out of the church for a while. And they turned him over to Satan for destruction of flesh. Now later, 2 Corinthians, he repents, and they bring him back into church. And, they, and Paul says, he suffered enough. Whew, I don't know what he went through, but it must have been bad. But Paul, for Paul to say, he suffered enough, let him, he's repented, and let him back in. And they did. See, I like, I like Christianity because there's always hope. And there's always, in the end, restoration and forgiveness. Amen? Same thing with a marriage. A lot of times, I, I'm a marriage and family counselor and do that. have been doing it for 40 years now. Oh, here's my, here's my uh, advertisement for you. On our ministry fair, if any of you would like to counsel, if you counsel before and would like to counsel, I would like to put somebody along with me on my counseling uh, team. And I'm, I'm looking for people to help me with that. So... When you go to the ministry fair, come to my booth, talk to me about being on the counseling team. But on, in a marriage, sometimes you say, never write a divorce. Well, sometimes people have to go through a divorce so they can be restored later in a good way. I don't want them to, but sometimes it happens. But my, my way of counseling them is always for restoration in the end if possible. That's what I try to do. Okay? I try to lead them to restoration and forgiveness. So, wherever you're at, Jonah's on the back of the ship, and he says, "Wake up, sleeper! What are you doing? Get up and pray." <laughs> so, what, how did, what was the solution to that that deal? He said, "It's me. I'm the problem. I'm why y'all are about to sink. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but I ran away from God. I didn't go to the Ninevites, and he's judging y'all, and y'all are all gonna die with me. Isn't that bad?" Isn't that bad that a Christian that's in sin can bring problems on other people? Not only problems on their own family, he was about to, that whole ship was about to lose their lives because of that idiot that didn't do what he was supposed to do. He's sleeping, running away from God, causing problems on other people. Woo, that's bad. He said, I'm wrong. <laughs> it's me. Throw me overboard. No, no, no. Let's do all our stuff. He said, no. Throw me overboard and it'll be all right. <laughs> They threw him overboard, what happened? Storm went away. Big fish came. Took Jonah away. Carried him all the way to the shore of Nineveh and threw him up on the shore. 
Now, buddy, you're going to do what God said, or you going you want me to take you back out for another ride? <laughs> we don't know the fish talked to him, but God sure did. When he, when he hit the ground that time, his feet were moving. He went to Nineveh and preached like God told him to. Listen, don't be the Jonah in your generation. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the cure, okay? We got we got to do that. Listen, time to pray for America because I believe that it's it's right outside the gate. Did you hear what happened to Israel yesterday or the day before? I was listening to the news and, and things caught my attention. It was a major invasion. Did you realize it wasn't just rockets? They came by land, sea, and air. Yeah. They had drones that killed some of their Abram 1A tanks. They had they dropped paratroopers that had the paragliders. They flew in on paratroopers and came in. They threw a bunch of soldiers in there, and they're taking over the civilians' houses and in one day. Now, I'm praying for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm, I'm pro-Israel, and I'm for Israel, and I hope we can help them win that. They didn't expect it, did they? America thinks we're the strongest nation on earth. It's going to be okay. We're all right. Nobody can defeat us. Don't think that way. Don't think that way. Pray for America. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, he says, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. If my people who are called by my name, who is that? You that? Raise your hand if that's you. That's us. My people, God's people, will pray, turn from their wicked ways. He said, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. The only hope we have left, hope, I did that on purpose, the only hope we have left is that you and I get things right. Arise, O oh sleeper. What are you doing sleeping? The ship's sinking and you're sleeping. Get up. Talk to your God. <laughs> See, that verse is for us. Because the church across America has been asleep for a long time. Okay? I wake up. I don't think you're all of you are asleep. I think some of y'all are trying your best. Keep it up. I don't know all your hearts, and God, but God does. Don't be the problem. Be part of the cure. The team is going to come up. We're going to have a time of prayer. While they're singing, you pray and ask God what you need to do about what you've heard today. We're going to have a team out in the prayer room right back there on the right of the sound booth. And if God has spoken to you and, and talking to you today, go back and talk to them. You want to get things right with God, you want to get saved, if you've never been saved, <coughs> go there and talk to them if you want to be a part of our church and join our church. Go back and talk to them. We'd love to hear from you.